Good morning again. Please turn to the book of Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 to begin this morning. Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7. Unlove, U-N-L-O-V-E, unlove is deadly. It is a cancer. It may kill slowly, but it always kills in the end. Let us fear it, fear to give room to it as we would fear to nurse a cobra. It is deadlier than any cobra, and just as one minute drop of the almost invisible cobra venom spreads swiftly all over the body of one into whom it has been injected, so one drop of the gall of unlove in my heart or yours, however unseen, has a terrible power of spreading through our family, for we are one body, we are parts of one another. Let's open in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this morning, the opportunity to study your word once again on this topic of the most excellent way, the way of love. Lord, help us guard against unlove and help us learn to grow in love. Help us learn proper motivation and foundation for love and practice of love in the weeks ahead. Lord, thank you for your word, what it teaches us. May we become more Christ-like as a result of studying it again this morning. Amen. Last week we began our eight-week sermon series on the most excellent way, the way of love. And the small groups gathered together, a bunch of you gathered together this past week to discuss the topic further and, uh, and grow in it, and that's great. Last week we looked at 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 3 and how 5 minus, uh, 5 minus 1 equals 0. All these five great things in 1 Corinthians 13, but apart from love, they're nothing, right? It says, if I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, nothing. Just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, nothing. If I have great faith, but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, but don't have love, nothing. Even if I sacrifice my body to be burned, but have not love, nothing. That's what we looked at last week. Today we look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, and the letter from Jesus to the church at Ephesus. We actually looked at the seven letters to the churches in Revelation as a church family a while back, not too long ago. But since this one relates so much to what we're talking about, we'll look at this one just briefly to begin here this morning. Revelation 2, verses 1 to 7. It reads, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, whom I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. So the church in Ephesus had some good things going for it. Hard work, toil, patient endurance, bearing up for God's namesake, for Christ's namesake, some great stuff. But verse 4, once again, it's almost like it's all nothing without love because Jesus says, I have this thing against you though. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Scholars will often say probably he's talking about the, their love for God or their love for Christ and their love for one another. They used to have this great love for one another and they've lost it. And Jesus tells them that if they don't repent of this loss of love, he's going to remove their lampstand, it said there in verse 5, basically meaning he would end their church. He would see to it that their church dies out if they do not repent and return to loving. You could basically sum it up by saying that Jesus is saying, love or die. Return to being loving or they will cease to exist as a church, Jesus says. Jesus will see to it that their church does not continue if they do not return to being loving. 
And so this shows us kind of point one or a main point for today that love is a big deal to God. He basically says love or die here. It is a big deal to God. Love is not secondary or optional or good for some people but not good for others. Love is not an idea or a concept that we can just agree to disagree about. Love is not something that some personalities gravitate towards while others don't, and it's okay either way. It's not okay either way. It's only okay if we are loving. Love is a big deal to God, absolutely essential. It needs to be a part of our lives. In fact, it needs to be a big, huge, and constantly growing part of our lives, certainly not a small or shrinking part of our lives. 1 Peter 1.22 even says to love one another earnestly. Think of your brothers and sisters in Christ, your fellow Christians, fellow believers. Do you love one another and do you love one another earnestly? And what would that look like for you? Amy Carmichael, famous missionary who rescued abused children and provided a home for them in India, recognized the deadly potential of loss of love among her co-workers and so she laid down these guidelines for the women who worked for her, with her, in the orphanage. Writing, unlove is deadly. It is a cancer. It may kill slowly, but it always kills in the end. Let us fear it. Fear to give room to it as we would fear to nurse a cobra. It is deadlier than any cobra. And just as one minute drop of the almost invisible cobra venom spreads swiftly all over the body of one into whom it has been injected, so one drop of the gall of unlove in my heart or yours, however unseen, has a terrible power of spreading through our family, for we are one body, we are parts of one another. So point one, love is a big deal to God. And in light of that, we need to make sure that we are loving each other well. And I I mean, I know we are, but we need to make sure we are growing in this area of loving each other well, because it is a big deal to God. He says that churches that don't love will cease to exist, and he'll see to it that they cease to exist. So how can we grow in loving one another earnestly and better and growing in this area? Well, partly that's what this whole sermon series is about and all the small groups that many of you are connected with. We're answering that question bit by bit every week that we get together. But specifically for today, let's think about what can and should motivate us towards greater love for one another. If someone is motivated, there is no end to what they can accomplish. But if they're not motivated, nothing happens. So how can we grow and what should motivate us towards love for one another? Think for a moment of what you are personally motivated by. Sadly, a lot of people are, are kind of motivated by what's easiest for them, what's, what's in it for them, selfishness, self-centeredness, what's, what makes them happy even at the expense of other people sometimes. But that's obviously not the motivation we should be looking for. What what should motivate us towards love for one another? In the heyday of the New York Yankees, manager Joe McCarthy once interviewed a coach brought up to the majors from a Yankee farm team, and he asked him, how much do you know about psychology? The coach said that he'd studied it in college. So you think you're good, said McCarthy. The coach replied, I don't know how good I am, but it's a subject I've studied. All right, McCarthy said, I'll give you a test. McCarthy said that a few years before, he had a problem and had gone to Frank Corsetti, his shortstop. Frank McCarthy said, I'm not satisfied with the way Lou Gehrig is playing first base. He's too lackadaisical. I want you to help me. From now on, charge every ground ball. When you get it, fire it as quickly and as hard as you can to first base. Knock Gehrig off the bag if you can. Throw it right through him if you can. Corsetti demurred and said, but maybe Lou won't like the idea. Who cares what Gehrig likes, McCarthy snaps. Just do as I tell you. McCarthy then said to the coach, now that's the story. What conclusions do you draw from it? The coach considered for a minute, then said, I guess you're trying to wake up Gehrig. See, McCarthy shrugged his shoulders in resignation. You missed the point entirely. There wasn't a single thing wrong with Gehrig. Corsetti was the one who was sleeping. I wanted to wake up Corsetti. So that's one type of motivation. He says, that's, a, that's indirect motivation though. It's kind of a little bit sneaky. It works in sports sometimes, that's great. 
But that's not how we're going to be motivated to love one another indirectly or in a little bit of a sneaky way. A teenager lost a contact lens while playing basketball in the driveway. After a fruitless search, he came in and told his mother, I looked everywhere, it's nowhere to be found, I've lost it. And undaunted, the mother went out to look for it, came back in a few minutes later, holding it in her hand. I looked really hard for that, Mum, the youth said. How did you manage to find it when I didn't? And the mum replied, we weren't looking for the same thing. You were looking for a little piece of plastic. I was looking for $150. <laughs> That's called being motivated by money. But we won't be talking about that kind of motivation either today. But how many people are motivated by money? It's amazing what you can do when you're motivated. Terry Spaccatelli wrote in the Reader's Digest about motivation, saying, at the busy dental office where I worked, one patient was always late. Once when, he, he call, when I called to confirm an appointment, he said, I'll be about 15 minutes late. That won't be a problem, will it? No, no problem, I replied. We just won't have time to give you the anesthetic. And that day he arrived early. That's called being motivated by a desire to avoid pain. But we're not really talking about that kind of motivation this morning either. How about this one? One more. It was the late October 1944 when an officer commanding a platoon of American soldiers received a call from headquarters. Over the radio, this captain learned his unit was being ordered to recapture a small French city from the Nazis, and he learned something else from headquarters as well. For weeks, French resistance fighters had risked their lives to gather information about the German fortifications in that city, and they had smuggled this information out to the Allies. The French underground's efforts had, been, had provided the Americans with something worth its weight in gold, a detailed map of the city. And it wasn't just a map with the names of major streets and landmarks, it showed specific details of the enemy's defensive positions. Indeed, the map even identified shops and buildings where German soldiers bunked or where a machine gun nest or a sniper had been stationed. Block by block, the Frenchmen gave an accounting of the German units and the gun placements they manned. For a captain who was already concerned about mounting casualty lists, receiving this information was an answer to prayer. Although the in outcome of the entire war didn't depend on this one skirmish, to him it meant he wouldn't have to write as many letters to, his par uh, to men's parents or wives telling their loved ones had been cut down in battle. Before the soldiers moved out to take their objective, the captain gave each man the chance to study the map. And he wanted to make sure his men read it carefully, and so he hurriedly gave them a test covering the major landmarks and the enemy strongholds. Just before the platoon moved out, the officer graded the test, and with minor exceptions, every man earned a perfect score. As a result of having that map, the men recaptured the city with little loss of American lives. Nearly 30 years after that military operation took place, an army researcher heard the story and decided to base a study on it. The project began in France where instead of a platoon of soldiers, he arranged for a group of American tourists to help him in his research. For several hours, the men and women in the group were allowed to study the map just like the soldiers had and then they were given the same test. And you can guess the results, the tourists failed miserably. And the reason for the difference between these two groups is obvious. It's motivation. Knowing their lives were on the line, the soldiers were highly motivated to study and remembering, remember this map. Knowing it was just a fun test, the tourists were not motivated. That's called motivated by a desire to survive. And that is a strong motivation. And it shows that if you are motivated, there's no end to what you can accomplish. Since Revelation chapter 2, Jesus says basically love or die, we should be highly motivated to love and maybe for some of us, Revelation 2 and that kind of love to survive is, is all we need. J Jesus says love is a matter of survival. That's a, a form of motivation. As a church, we want to survive. In fact, we don't want to just survive. We want to, to thrive and grow and so we need to be loving. But even that's not really the motivation that we're mainly talking about this morning. We're mainly talking about two different loves that motivate us towards love. 
And those two things that motivate us will be the remaining two points of this sermon. Number one, our first motive to love one another is the love of Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. If you're fairly fast at finding things, 2 Corinthians right after 1 Corinthians. If that helps, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 15. The love of Christ motivates us. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15 says, For the love of Christ controls us. Or some versions will say the love of Christ compels us. Or the love of Christ constrains us. You can kind of think the love of Christ motivates us. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Notice in this verse, Paul is not saying that his love for Christ is controlling or compelling or constraining or motivating him. He's saying that it's Christ's love for him that controls him, that compels him, that motivates him. Paul never in his whole entire life never got over how amazing it is to be loved by God, to be loved by Jesus Christ. God's love is so incredible that it, sent, it led him to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for the sins of sinners like you and me. God's love had him sacrifice his own son. Think for a moment about the great love that to sacrifice your own son. To make people like us who were his enemies into his friends. God's love is simply unfathomable in its greatness. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you have not yet responded to God's love, I urge you to do that this morning. Respond to God's love by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, Christ, believing that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. And then when he is your Savior and Lord and the greatest treasure of your life, never get over his great love, but allow it to motivate you towards loving one another more and more. Allow it to control you, to compel you, to constrain you. C.T. Studd, the famous missionary, at least for those who know church history and know missionaries, he's somewhat famous. He knew well of the love of God when he said, and he said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. He knew the love of Jesus Christ. And, and if, if C.T. Studd is correct, and he is, that God's love is that great, then no sacrifice we can make for him can be too great, including the sacrifice of loving one another, the obedience of loving one another. The song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, has that well-known line at the end of the last verse that relates to God's love motivating us when it says, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. God's amazing love motivates us to love him in return and to love one another since we're all part of his family. One of the reasons, perhaps, that we're not as loving as we should be or not growing in love the way that we want to, one of the reasons, perhaps, is that we don't know enough or we don't think enough about God's amazing love for us. You might think it's simple to know all about God's love for you, but if you think that, it means you actually haven't thought about it enough and you don't fully grasp God's love for you because God's love is infinite. And until you've grasped that you can't fully grasp it, you've nev you'll never have grasped it. God's love is infinite. So understanding his love is not easy. If it were easy, Paul wouldn't pray hard in the Bible for people to understand God's love more. But that's actually exactly what he does. In the Bible, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 18, Paul prays for believers in Christ to better understand God's love for them. In Ephesians 3, verses 18 to 19, Paul prays that the believers in Christ, like us, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. We should pray that for ourselves and each other that we could better grasp 
God's love. What a great prayer to pray for each other. Lord Jesus, help us to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of your love that surpasses knowledge. We'll never fully grasp God's amazing love for us because it surpasses knowledge, but we can grasp it more and more and and learn more about it, experience it more, think about it more every day, including today and in the days to come. Think about his love. The, The king came down to die to save his enemies. The amazing love. We were once his enemies. Now we're seated at his table as his friends because of his amazing, amazing love. No matter what you've done or who you are, you are loved. And Jesus loves you so much. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. We need to understand more about God's great love for us and then that will motivate us towards living all of the Christian life, including loving one another. Many of the famous people, missionaries and others in church history who have, who have lived for God, serving and sacrificing and devoted their lives so much to God, they, they're, they're quoted as saying, the great motivation in my life was knowing that I was loved by God. God's great love for me motivated me to sacrifice and live for Him. We need to better understand how sinful we are and how holy God is and then understand that despite that infinite gap between our sinfulness and his holiness, he chooses to love us. He chooses to love us. If we could grasp that, we would be so highly motivated. If we could grasp his everlasting, never-ending, never-giving-up, never-stopping love, let, us, let that motivate us in our quest to love each other. And then number two, motivation number two, is then our love for Christ motivates us to love one another. But first, it's Christ's love for us. First and foremost, it is Christ's love for us that motivates us. And then secondly, as a response, it's our love for Christ that motivates us not just to love him, but to love each other in his family. The great Shema of the Old Testament, which turns into the great commandment in the New Testament, says to love God with everything we've got, heart and soul and mind and strength. And if we love God, we are then motivated to obey his commands to love other people. John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. That love for for Jesus as a motivating factor. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments aren't burdensome because mainly they just boil down to love. And love is not supposed to be burdensome. It's supposed to be love. Now, of course, some people are more difficult to love than others, and we understand that. Can I get an amen? Some people are more difficult to love than others. Some of you might be thinking you're sitting beside one of those people right now or just in front of them. If you are, maybe just turn your neck and look at them for a moment so they'll kind of get the message. You're one of... But then if they ask you after church, were you looking at me when Mark said that? Just say, no, no, I was trying to look at the back at the clock to see if the sermon was almost done. It just was coincidental timing. And I hurt my neck, and then I just kind of, kind of focused on you for a minute, but it's a neck injury. It wasn't anything intentional to say that you're an undifficult to love. But really, if you're hurting your neck sitting in church, you're probably really out of shape. You need to start stretching or something before you sit down next week if you're hurting your neck in church. But seriously, some people are more difficult to love than other people, but we still need to love them. We still need to love them. And, and if it's all about them, our motive will dry up. But if it's about Christ's love for us and then our love for Christ, and then that motivates us to love even the difficult, to love people. Now, it is true that sometimes we have to put up boundaries in our lives to, to keep from being abused or manipulated by people who will try to take advantage of our love for them. That's true. You could read that boundaries book that we have in the church library by Christian psychologists who talk about this idea that you've got to love, love the difficult people, but even sometimes have boundaries. That's, there's a truth there. But we still need to love them, even while figuring out 
how to best love them without being abused or manipulated and so on. I know that can get a little, t- little complicated with some exceptional circumstances, but our call is to love, and it's not about other people and how good they are to love. It's about Christ's love for us, our love for Christ, and then we're motivated towards loving other people. We're not loving them just for the sake of them. We're loving them because of Jesus and for Jesus. Our love for Christ is the foundation. His love for us and then our love for him. So understand today that love is a big deal to God. He tells the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2 to love or to die. 1 Peter 1.22 says love one another earnestly. Earnestly, not dragging our heels, but earnestly. And so to help you think of how to love others better and be motivated, think about the motivation. It's not about fear or guilt or indirect motivation or about our own avoidance of pain or all these different things that motivate people. It's about the love of Christ for us and our love for him. You can't be motivated by people because people will just let you down. We all will let each other down. That's part of life. But Jesus will never let us down. And so he has to be the reason and the foundation and the focus. So in conclusion, this is a short sermon because we want to have time to welcome in the new members here before the service is over. In conclusion, we are motivated ultimately when we say Christ's love for us and then our love for Christ. You can sum it up by saying we are motivated by the gospel. The gospel is what motivates us to love one another. Christ's love for us is shown in the gospel, in his sacrifice for us. Our love for Christ comes as a response. So our motivation to love others is gospel motivation. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, for the Christian life, and for motivation in the Christian life. Motivation to to live a life worthy of the gospel, like Philippians 1 verse 27 says. Motivation to live a life worthy of the gospel comes from the gospel. We need to be motivated by the gospel. If we think we're supposed to love other people to get saved or to stay saved or because we feel guilty, we're missing the mark and it's not going to last. But if we are motivated by love, by Christ's love for us, by the gospel, then we're, then we're on track and then we can have lasting love for one another. Religious kind of people are motivated by, by fear or they're motivated by guilt or they're motivated by these kind of wrong, difficult, negative motivations. But gospel people, believers in Jesus Christ, we are motivated by the gospel and, then, and by Christ's love for us, our love for him, and then grateful joy. We're motivated by gratitude. It's not fear and guilt and, oh, I got to do this. It's, I love Jesus. He loves me first. I love him. And you're motivated by grateful joy. It's amazing what you can accomplish if you are motivated correctly. And so it's amazing what we can accomplish together as a church family, what we are accomplishing, what we can accomplish more and more if we're motivated by the gospel to live for Christ, including loving one another. Let's close in prayer, then we'll have a closing song, but it won't be the close of the service. Then we're going to welcome in the new members after that. Lord, thank you for our loving church family. Help us to grow in this area. Lord God, help us to be motivated not by fear or guilt, but to be motivated by the gospel, to be motivated by love, empowered by your your spirit, empowered by your love to, to love one another, Lord. Help us, empower us for your glory and the good of, of each other here in our church family, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.